how do you look at when you do your research and you have a considerable amount of research and writing, but as well, keep visualizing as well. How do you put these angles? Because if you look at humans, and I'm sure in your history is more important than ever because you have the creative side, you have the philosophical and theological side, and then the technology side as a futurist as well, and the entrepreneur. How do you mm -hmm. look at this part, especially the ideas part? Because it's I come as well from a literature background and poetry and uh, coming to the technology sometimes. Now I think it's easy to mix, but it's quite complex to put the two things together, and especially if you speak with technologists or developers especially Silicon Valley or China, it's kind of a different ballgame. Yeah, I mean, I think for a long time, the first uh, edition of the internet was essentially a place to where technology was like the, the biggest thing, you know, it was going to make everything whole and fix all of our problems and, and all this kind of thing. And, and now we have to realize that, that technology is fantastic, but it doesn't solve every problem. I think technology can solve climate change, maybe. It can solve hunger and food and energy, yes. But we're still going to need a lot of policy, a lot of decision making about doing the right thing. So I always say that we have all the tech and the science. We're inventing stuff every week now. It's just truly mind boggling, right? But we're lacking the telos, you know, the will, the Greek word for will and the purpose. And I think when you look at humans, it's so important to realize that humans are not driven by technology. They're not, you know, we're not robots or data engines. You know, we're, we have a lot more than that, more different kinds of intelligence. And humans are driven by experiences, by relationships, um, by emotions, by non-technical things, right? You know, humans are multinary. We can do many different things, not binary. Machines are binary, right? Um, so we are really quite different than machines, uh, even though some of it can be explained like a machine, like the working of the brain and stuff, right? But we are definitely not machines. And so ultimately, to me, it has always mattered a lot um, is to safeguard what makes us human. Uh, uh, and that, of course, generally is called being a humanist, right? <laughs> so, uh, and being a humanist doesn't mean that everything else doesn't matter, like the world or the plants, the animals and the planet and so on. But all our environment and ourselves, you know, that is the top priority. I think that we have to look at everything that we do it has to have a, a kind of flourishing aspect of helping us to flourish and helping our environment to flourish and putting it back into a natural combination of things, you know, a holistic view. And that's been that's a very European angle, angle that was quite difficult often to get across to Americans, for example, or or in China as well, which is much more technology driven, or of course money driven, right? In the sense of corporate capitalism. Right. So that that's always been a big story for me to figure out uh, you know, what is the purpose? Where are we going with this? Does it have collective benefit or is it just another way to make more money? Which is okay, you know, but it doesn't have to be that way every time. Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. I, and I have already immediately some questions uh, on that level, but I want to go back to, so in your work, there's a couple of topics. And like you said, the futuristic and the humanist have been always working together. So mm -hmm. in terms of your uh, uh, work uh, and as well research, well, I know that you have a lot of topics that you are right now researching, but there's a couple of them that you are more um, looking for. So what would be, for instance, if you look at the uh, one of the things that you have in a lot of things you do is practical wisdom and how mm -hmm. to pursue the practical wisdom and as well how we can actually get humanity uh, in the middle of all the complexity of, of what the society that we have right now. And you have as well something very interesting that is EQ so and meets IQ. So do you want to yeah. highlight this and as well the foundations of your futuristic uh, vision? Yeah, I mean, I, I take a holistic view of people. I think that we are in many ways, uh, con uh, compared to machines, we're actually very inefficient. Uh, and we break down, we change our mind, we have, we lie, we make mistakes, right? We're the opposite of machines. But we're also very efficient as a machine, or brain machine is extremely efficient, the human brain. Um, but I look at this and I say, okay, really what is important to our future uh, is to emphasize the things that make us human, because machines will surpass eventually, already are in some ways, our, our logic, right, and our memorization and our computing capacity, uh, that's probably going to happen within the next 10 years, you know, so that a machine in principle can know everything, which humans can't, right? It can see everything, right? Uh, but humans, of course, see, see things very differently. So to me, this kind of um, understanding of what we are 
and how we can make that go into the future has become a key theme. For example, when I speak about work, I always say that the future of our work is to do things that machines can't do. And, and, there, and that's always been true, of course, right? But now it's especially true because machines can, you know, look at my financial uh, well-being. They can, of course, uh, robots can do our production work and cars can be self-driven and so on. But many things that we do is very hard to automate, right? The moral edge paradox, whatever is easy for a computer is hard for a human and vice versa. Right? So I look at these things like the EQ and I say, really, what is important to us is, you know, humans have eight different kinds of intelligences. You know, we have emotional intelligence, EQ. Uh, we have kinesthetic, the body, right? Uh, we have social intelligence. None of that a computer has or, or could have. It doesn't have a body. It doesn't feel. Uh, it doesn't know music. Right? It doesn't understand what feelings are. It can see them, but it doesn't understand them uh, in the sense of that we are. So we are very holistic in our intelligence. And that's why we're so far ahead of machines. It is not impossible that machines will eventually be able to simulate that. You know, once we have unlimited computing power, yes, and nuclear fusion, that may be possible. But the question is, do we want that? Right? I always say that uh, that's one of my key topics now is to say artificial intelligence, for example. We should make sure that those machines are competent. You know, they, they can get the job done, whatever the job is, whether it's medical or driving or flying an airplane. But I don't want the machine to be conscious sentient you know have human agency why right i mean that's what we do <laughs> right so i think we should cut it right there and say okay an artificial general intelligence a super intelligence that can be like a human and become sort of half sentient be very dangerous and also completely the wrong direction is not what we need right so this is one of my key arguments when i speak about what i call the good future uh and we are right here right now also because of the war Russia, Ukraine, and because of COVID, we're sort of at the pivot point of a new era. You know, there's a lot of things that are being questioned, and a lot of things are coming forward from the millennials and the Gen Y that are saying, "We don't want a life like you guys in your 60s or whatever." You know, it's going to be have to be different. So there's a great pivot point now towards a new way of looking at things uh, that goes beyond the usual description of you know work and job and profit and growth. Yeah, there's a lot of things uh, over there that are really very fundamental.